Well, welcome, good evening again um, to everybody here online and uh, in this uh, lecture hall. So like I said, tonight's talk will be given by uh, Rainier Bars, uh, our own professor by special appointment in the history of decorative arts and senior curator of Furniture Arts Museum. After his talks, there will be a short period um, to ask some questions. And for those of you joining us online via live stream, you can send us your questions for Professor Barrison by clicking on the speech bubble in the bottom right corner of your screen. And finally, before giving the floor to Professor Barrison, I would like to thank the Rijksbureau for Kunsthistorische Documentatie for their generous financial support uh, for tonight's event, as well as the Van de Waal family, some of whom are in attendance tonight. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Barson to take the stage. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, process. An exhibition of European design drawings from the Rijksmuseum at the Design Museum in Den Bosch. Design drawings, a term that purists might deem a tautology, and I'll return to that um, later on. But first, the question, what is design? When Timo de Rijk um, and I, when Timo de Rijk was um, a professor in the history of design here at Leiden and I um, a professor in the history of the decorative arts, when we were together preparing um, an introductory class in the history of decorative arts and design um, for the four um, bachelor students, we, we asked ourselves this question. What is the meaning of design? Um, it's, it's, it's a vague term, it's a difficult term, just in fact like the decorative arts. Um, as I say, I, I was um, teaching the history of the decorative arts and I was meant to stop in about 1890. Kunstneverheid, Kunstgewerbe, meant to stop in about 1890. Of course, the problem now at Dutch universities, which I personally find a tragedy, when we are discussing notions of this kind, we are forced to think in English. Um, design, whereas Kunstneverheid and most of the terms Dutch theory uses stem, of course, from German theorists and possibly occasionally from French theory. But we are, we are forced to to, to, to communicate, as I need to do now, today, at a Dutch university in English, I think it's a, it's a great sadness. And I think Europe, I think Brexit may change all that, but that, that'll, be, um, that'll be for a later generation, sadly. Anyway, we were, we were discussing, Timo and I were thinking, well, what does it mean? Why does design seem to, to start in 1890? What is design? And then Timo said, well, one of the really uh, characteristic dividers is that in design, and perhaps you're talking about industrial design, you have a designer who is not himself involved in the execution of the work of art. He is, he is, um, he is designing, so the professional designer, and he may be working for various media. He may be designing something for silver or, uh, or furniture or other types of works of art. So I said, so you mean like Michelangelo, like Raphael, like Boucher? Uh, all that was happening before 1890. And we sort of ended up with, well, it, was, it wasn't a very original discussion, but we sort of, um, the idea, this notion, there is no really clear division um, between, be between the two. This is the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, which for many decades has advertised itself as the leading museum in the world for art and design. Of course, that wasn't inclusive enough, so now it is the leading, muse the leading uh, museum in the world for, for art, design, and performance, um, like many of these... Uh, of these changes due to people feeling excluded, it has sort of created an even less clear uh, image of what it is trying to project. But of course to say art and design me is, is making clear how, what, what a curious term design is and obviously what they sort of don't want to say is the decorative arts or the applied arts, but in a sense that is what they're saying because they're not the leading museum 
in, uh, of art, because I suppose the Prado could, could claim to be that, or perhaps the Kunsthistorisches. Um, but they're, they're, they're mixing the two words, art and design, in saying, basically, that they are the leading museum of objects, um, applied arts, but with an artistic with an artistic presence. Those works, of, those works of art, those objects to be used that are conceived, that were made as art. And as we will see, that uh, links them in a sense. Well, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. The design museum in Den Bosch, where the exhibition will take place, um, does concentrate, like, in a sense, all so-called design museums, I mean museums that call themselves design museums all over the world, on the 20th and 21st century. Uh, industrial design, but also crafts, curiously, of, the, of those ages, um, without, in a sense, going into that question of why, um, why, why do we feel that design starts in 1890? So by hosting this exhibition of, uh, of drawings for the decorative arts, drawings for objects from 1500 to 1900, earlier design drawings, as we call them, which is a terrible word, which is a sort of translation of Antwerp taking, another, another problematic um, English expression that we're, that we're forced to use. Um, by showing that exhibition, this design museum, not perhaps by chance now, uh, where by ch not perhaps by chance Timo Dreyck is now the director, is opening up this debate from the design museum's point of view and saying, well, why do we define ourselves the way we define ourselves? So we're very pleased that our collection of, of drawings can play a role in that, in that uh, debate. The Rijk Museum, known to you all, um, is a curious collection of museums. Um, it grew out of a number of, of very different museums. Of course, since we reopened in 2013, we've been much more integrated in our display. But those of you, and most of you probably remember it from before 2003, then there were very, more, very clearly um, di divided departments. And we have a, a very important, uh, one, of the, one of the greatest collections of international, both national and international decorative arts um, in the world. So we can be considered, in a sense, the Victoria and Albert Museum of, of the Netherlands, because that we, the Netherlands do not have that specialized decorative arts museum, uh, such as the Victoria and Albert Museum. As I say, we now have a mixed display, so most galleries at the Rijks Museum show paintings, history, decorative arts, sculpture, um, uh, mixed together to give a, a, a general impression of the culture of the Netherlands, basically, but also with foreign elements progressing. Um, but a, a room like this, devoted to uh, William and Mary, the period of William and Mary, still shows you that the decorative arts have this extremely strong presence throughout the display, um, so that, in a sense, we can still be considered the, the sort of, um, the, the, well, the peer um, of the Victorian Albert Museum in the Netherlands. What the Rijks Museum also has in its print room is a very large and um, celebrated old collection of, another difficult word, ornamentprente, ornamentstiche, yet another word that you can only understand if you know the German background. Um, the English don't really have a word for it. They decorative engravings, ornament prints. Uh, they are engravings, prints that show either objects like these two, which um, uh, are after Hans Fredemann de Vries of the 1560s and show two triangular salt cellars with covers. Um, or they show straight ornament, or they show elements of ornament, elements of object. It's a whole, um, it's a whole enormous field within engravings, within prints, and uh, well, within prints uh, that is ex exceptionally well um, uh, represented at the Rijks Museum. And we, for instance, used these two um, engravings from our collection 
when we had a small exhibition quite some time ago, now in about 1990, um, surrounding the acquisition of this rare object, a silver sword, a silver triangular sword with a cover made in Amsterdam in about 1618. Well, not in about, in 1618. Um, we showed other examples, uh, we showed pictures, but we also showed these engravings um, that represent the idea of the object on paper. What we didn't show, but would have wanted to show, but we knew we were going to ask it for an exhibition a few years later, was this drawing by Uteval um, of 1603 or possibly 1608, the last digit is difficult to read, of just such a triangular sort even more monumental than the one is executed, but very, very clearly inspiring that series of objects of which uh, the, the Amsterdam sword that I showed you is the, is the prime example in, that has survived. But, but here you see how Uteval has imagined even a great cupola formed uh, superstructure um, uh, 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 crowned by fortune, um, we don't know whether such an object was ever executed, but it shows that there was a great artist, Uteval, whose invention is at the core, at the beginning, of a new type of object that is being developed and in fact being made. We also didn't show this drawing from Stockholm by the famous Adam van Bijane, also showing two triangular salts with covers. So these drawings, um, this, this salt, there's no such salt surviving by Adam van Bijane. Uh, we don't know whether the drawing by Uteval was ever executed, but these drawings form a very essential part of understanding um, the genesis and the, the importance of certain types of objects uh, the artistic inspiration that went into the making of them um, and somehow corrects to a certain extent um, the, the, well, the, the mishaps or the happenings of history. For instance, silver has always almost, or more than 90% of old silver objects have been melted down, uh, but in, you know, furniture has been destroyed. A lot of objects do not survive and drawings may, may help to correct that image. What we also didn't show in the exhibition in 1990 is this drawing, which we certainly would have shown now because it now belongs to the Rijksmuseum. It is another drawing for such a triangular sort, um, probably made in Rome. It's attributed to Marco Marchetti, but many of these drawings are attributed to artists without much reason. People who deal with drawings, people who have worked with drawings are obsessed with attribution. It seems to be the only uh, uh, subject that interests them. So almost every drawing comes with a name, but very often if you, if you look more closely, these names are questionable. We often don't know who actually produced drawings of this kind. But here we have another drawing um, of a triangular sort with a figure at the center, very clearly um, an inspiration. This is of about the 1560s of that 17th century group of Dutch, of Dutch silver swords. So it's a sort of essential element for the collection at the Rijksmuseum to, to have drawings like these. And yet we never had them. We were not founded in the 19th century as a decorative arts museum of the kind at, let's say, the, the, the Victoria and Albert Museum or the Musée de la Décorative in Paris or the museum in Vienna or in Berlin, who, especially in the 19th century, concentrated on buying drawings of this kind, buying design drawings, Entwurfszeichnungen, uh, showing the idea for an object um, being created on paper. We were not such a museum. There was, never, uh, there was never a central museum for the decorative arts in Holland. Um, our decorative arts department grew out of quite a different um, tradition where this documentation of design in this way was not happening. 
I worked at the Victorian Albert Museum after, after uh, studying at Leiden University, and I was very much, I suppose, there, um, impressed, and uh, from, from the start, really, of dealing with the decorative arts, I realized what an important factor these drawings are. And very occasionally, uh, when an interesting drawing would come up, I would say to the director of the Panzer Cabinet, this would be good to buy because it's very interesting. You know, we have a cupboard that looks like it or something like that. And he says, oh, I see what you mean, but as a drawing, because they go for Rembrandt and Dürer, they have a very different attitude. So it was never really possible to even think of forming a collection that, um, that would fill this gap until 2013, when private individuals um, founded what we call the Decorative Art Fund, which was um, brought together especially for the acquisitions of this type of drawing. Now, of course, we are very late in the day. The great collections, as I say, were really formed in the late 19th century. So what we needed to do is to concentrate, to ve focus very much uh, in order to give the collection some kind of meaning. And we have from the start concentrated on drawings that actually show objects or show um, parts of an object or an object in a setting. Not, abs not ornament per se, of which there are huge amounts of drawings, not imaginary interior architecture, which very often are theater designs, uh, for instance, the collection of the Cooper Hewitt Museum, one of the largest collections in this field in America, is just swamped with theater designs and uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, we decided to go just only for, um, for drawings that show objects. And this one is a good example of um, such a drawing. And this is exactly what design means means. Here you see, and that's rather rare, um, an artist actually designing, actually imagining ornament or a piece of furniture, possibly a piece of silver. I actually tend to think now that it's for silver, but um, a frame. And he is thinking it out on paper. The way when you have a thought, you write it down. When you imagine a form or a composition, the only way you can really express that is through a drawing, through a disegno. Uh, Vasari um, already gave a very central position to disegno, to the art of drawing, which he called the father of all the arts. And uh, Karl van Mander followed him in that theory. So it was a general notion that um, the beginning of each work of art was in fact a disegno. A disegno which represented the ingenio, the idea that the artist had developed in his mind that he could not express, he could not talk about it. He, the only way to express it, the only way to communicate it was to draw it. Now here we see somebody who is imagining, an artist who is imagining a frame. It's a very, it's a very sophisticated, very involved composition where, in fact, you see the angel to the left, his wings turn into ornament. His wings turn into a kind of strap work of scrolls. I don't know of a single object that has such a daring conceit, a single executed object. Um, and at the corner, at the upper corner, that scroll inter intertwines with another scroll coming from the central group of two angels at the top. Now, he wasn't quite satisfied with, with his first invention, so he drew a line across um, below that upper scroll, and he repeated the line at the center of the frame and redrew that composition. So the, 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 the dark line that you see at the center corresponds with the line he's drawn across the, low, uh, the left frame. And there he is inventing again this very sophisticated, rather cos de poids for those in, of you who are in the know, which of course there are many, rather cos de poids type ornament. Um, we don't know where it was drawn. I, the style is, to my idea, Florentine, the style of the object. 
But then, of course, dr um, drawings expert immediately say, oh, no, no, that couldn't possibly be Florentine. So there's always that, um, well, that struggle. But this is that rare thing, a real design on paper, somebody designing an object on paper. We call, whenever such a drawing comes onto the market, it's called an ontwerptekening. And that's really the, so an entwurfszeichen, yet again, a, a German notion, an ontwerptekening. Um, and that is how they're always presented. But um, as you will see, most of them are not ontwerptekeningen. Most of them play, have played a role at another phase of the process of imagining, creating, selling, and recording works of art. Now that word process, um, I once sat next to the director of the Cooper Hewitt Museum, as I say, who has that amazing, huge collection, tens of thousands of sheets, so you'd think we'd be jealous. And I, I told her about this collection, and she said, I'm rather jealous of that collection because it has a real point. It's about process, meaning that her shelves and shelves and boxes and boxes full of drawings that she had sometimes had difficulty giving them, yeah, giving them a sense. So this idea of process, uh, I really stole from her, and is now the guiding line for the exhibition um, that we're gonna show at Den Bosch. It's the guiding line, what we are hoping to, to mm, not find out, of course, but what we're, what we're trying to investigate and that what we're hoping to make the viewers, the public, think about is what role did these drawings play? What role did each individual drawing play in that process? How did they accompany the process of, as I say, making, imagining, making, selling works of art? So this is the, we've, we've, um, we're gonna, divide the exhibition in, uh, in chapters that follow the various steps of that process. Now, of course, most drawings aren't as clearly, um, don't as clearly belong to a single category as this one. So um, sometimes you use a drawing for what to, to illustrate one point, which might just as well be an example of a slightly different phase in that process but simply by presenting these drawings in this way, so to, let's say, accompany the chronology of the making of a work of art, um, we, hope to, we hope to create interest in, in them in a different way and to, to um, well, that's basically what, what Timo and I were, were thinking about, to give an, a new depth or to suggest a new depth to the idea of design. This is another example of such a pure design drawing, Jean-Charles de la Fosse, who was a draftsman, famous draftsman and designer of prints in the 1760s and 70s in Paris. And he was known to always be drawing. He never stopped drawing. He was a, a professor at the, um, at the Drawing Academy in Paris, and he never stopped inventing forms. His, his head overflowed with new ideas, which again he formulated by putting them on paper like this. So another, let's say, pure design, perhaps not geared at the same, lo at the same practical um, uh, uh, use as the one we saw before. Here we have the design drawing back that I showed you before, the drawing back for a sort. Um, but now it stands for the next chapter, which is alternatives. If you look at the drawing, you see that the left-hand side is completely different from the right-hand side. And in fact, where they match up is, qu is quite an awkward moment. So the draftsman isn't even suggesting that this is a single object. He is very mm -hmm. clearly offering you two options in a single drawing, alternative mm -hmm. options. Um, the idea is that a patron may make a choice, may, may uh, express a preference for one or the other suggestion, but also sometimes that seems a little far-fetched. Um, so perhaps it may just also be a designer showing how inventive he is and that he can just turn his hand to whatever solution um, he, 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 he is taken by. But certainly what is clear about a drawing like this is it's not 
um, it does not represent something that already exists. It clearly is an idea, and it gives two ideas, in fact, in a single drawing. Then there is what we call the perfect design. Um, uh, a drawing that looks as if it's really representing something that might exist, a totally finished invention, often beautifully presented, like this drawing for a, for a, a covered cup made in Nuremberg around 1585, probably in the workshop or around the workshop of the famous Wenzel Jamnitzer, who was the foremost artist in Nuremberg at the time. And there's a group at Erlangen, well, that's a bit detailed, but um, of very similar drawings, which already in the 16th century were given his initials. So there's a clear, there's a clear link to, um, to the inventiveness, to the, to the workshop of Wenzel Jamnitzer. We know cups of this kind, but they're almost always, well, they are always triangular. They have three openings, three sort of curving out sec sections, whereas if you look at this drawing, it's meant to have four. That is one of the reasons why one can assume that this is an idealized design and not something that was actually ever executed in this way. This is an, a drawing of made by Percier, the famous um, Napoleonic architect Percier. So what you see is we move through the ages in every, in every section of the of process. It's not a chronological exhibition, it's an exhibition that's going to hopefully make viewers think about the function of these drawings. And here we are in the perfected design, Charles Percier showing an empire commode, very extraordinary piece, decorated with boo marquetry, very old-fashioned technique for that time, and inset at the center with a Pietro Dura, with a Florentine hardstone mosaic plaque, probably dating from the late 17th century, so using an antique object to decorate um, a, a very modern, very avant-garde piece of furniture around 1805. In this case, we can be sure that the that the piece never existed because the plaque exists. That, that Pietro Dura plaque is in existence. It was, it was sawn down to a circular format and not used as, as suggested by Percier for a commode, but more or less at the same time as the top for a gilt bronze guéridon. So there was an idea of perhaps using that Florentine mosaic plaque that obviously was in Paris in about 1805 as the centerpiece for this extremely glamorous and lavish commode, but that was not done. Instead, the, uh, the, the, um, the plaque was used, um, was used as the top of that table. This is an extremely interesting um, example, a very, early historicism. We are in fact here at Empire, which is still, which is regarded, classically speaking, as the last, let's say, original style, before the mixture of historic styles of the 19th century sets in. Um, but in this Empire setting, um, Percier is already, and probably in, in connection with uh, Jacob Demalter, the famous ebeniste for whom he worked a great deal, he is already imagining reusing this early technique of boo marquetry, and then, of course, there are the more, the more usual references to, to Greek, to Roman emperors, and, and, and things like that. At the Rex Museum, we have, we have this famous secretaire, which was bought in 1803 by Lord Elgin in Paris as a very modern piece of furniture, as the le dernier cri of what uh, the, the, the smartest dealer at that time, Mignereux, could present in his shop. We know this because Lord Elgin bought a lot of things, and the bills survive, and this was by far the most expensive piece he bought. And in the bill, it says, inset with une plaque ancienne de porcelaine de France, meaning it's inset with an old plaque of Serre porcelain in 1802. The bill was um, in 1802. 
the almost the earliest example we know of modern people, in modern designers incorporating what we now would call antiques, what we call uh, an ancien regime work of art, something that was actually totally out of fashion, multicolored, something people were rejecting. No, they're not rejecting it, they're admiring it and they're presenting it. The secretaire is almost like a, like a stage, like an easel for a painting, uh, and the painting is the uh, serve plug made only 40 years earlier. It's a very revolutionary piece. Um, it's a great rarity. We're, we're thrilled to have it at the Rec Museum. But of course, now to have this drawing by Persier, different but similar, puts it in a much wider context. The next chapter is for the church. Um, now that seems to be deviating from, uh, you were talking about various types of designs, but church commissions, which of course play a role in, in, in every field, um, are distinguished in a way because they are usually decided upon by by a group of people, by a committee, we would now happily say in Holland. It's not one great prince or one great patron who orders um, something that he, that he might desire, but it is a church and there is usually, um, well, the finances have to be discussed a little bit more carefully than, uh, than when a prince is just sort of saying, make this and then afterwards his financial people have to somehow try and and pay for it. Here, there is more of a, as I say, there are meetings, there are discussions about the spending of what one might almost call public funds. And that means that these drawings take on a different role. There's very often a contract written out about the making of, in this case, a pulpit. This is a, um, by Verhage, um, uh, a sculptor from Malines who was making a pulpit for a church nearby, which was in fact executed. And um, this is a huge expense for a church. So um, before deciding, before giving out the, 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 the commission, a drawing is made, very often a modello is then made, a, a, a three-dimensional sculptural model, um, and a contract is drawn up and the contract refers to the drawing. It says it has to be like the drawing and this and that. So in this case, in, for church commissions, it's not unique for church commissions. It also happens in secular commissions. But we use this chapter to show drawings that, that uh, take on a legal character. They take on the character of a document in, um, in a legal, in, in a, a legal uh, decision. Now, one of the things that, that, that you come, come upon uh, when you study drawings like this is who drew them, who could draw. As I say, uh, print room experts, drawing experts on the whole are not very interested in these drawings um, because they very often aren't by great artists. Of course, Albrecht Dürer uh, um, uh, designed silverware and other people. There are drawings by great artists, Holbein, Boucher, uh, like that. There are many. But the large majority of these drawings are anonymous. And they, um, they, they bring us to the question, who was able to draw? Could you make something without being able to draw it? You probably could. I mean, there was an idea, um, there was a great collector of drawings of this kind. He said every object before it was made must have been drawn. That doesn't seem to be the case. If you go into documents um, uh, at the guild, for instance, at the guilds um, for silversmith or for furniture makers, a division is often made between those artists that they call slavish, I mean, we now couldn't use the word anymore, but they call them slavish, meaning artisans that really are trained to reproduce works of art that have been made already from, you know, if you think in pewter spoons, uh, you can just go on producing pewter spoons without ever perhaps, without ever needing to draw them yourself. The, the, the higher up you come in the sort of uh, creative atmosphere, the more necessary it is for an, for, an, for an artisan, for a craftsman to be able to be 
to, to draw. And those people, rather than Slavs, slavish, were described as people geestrijk, who could design, who could make things from their geest, from their mind, from their spirit, and the spirit was expressed in the design. So geest is ingenio. Geest is the uh, geest is the mystery that is expressed in the disegno. But craftsman, somebody making a table, was it necessary that he that he could draw it? We don't really know, but we um, we devote a chapter to it, and um, in that chapter we concentrate on furniture makers, and especially furniture makers from Germany. Because in German cities, there was a very strict regulation at the guild that before making your masterpiece, if you wanted to become a member of a guild, you had to make a masterpiece. You had to produce a, a piece of furniture, a piece of silver, to show that you could become a master. Now, in Germany, in almost all German cities, you had to, before submitting that masterpiece, submit a Meisterriss, a drawing of the piece you were intending to make. This was apparently not true everywhere. In Groningen, in Holland, there are, in the Guild archives, drawings of a table and of a chair. And if you wanted to become a master, you had to make a table and a chair like those in the drawing. So apparently, you were not required to submit your own drawing. But in Germany, on the whole, you were. Now, these Meisterrisse, uh, when they survive, they are, they are yeah, in, in sort of state institutions that have grown out of or that have accepted the guild archives when the guilds were abolished in Napoleonic times. So it's very difficult for us now as a museum to buy a Meisterrisse, but this I hope, you can, I hope it's clear enough, it's rather a faint drawing. This drawing, um, a design very much the way a Meisterriss is drawn, with the front, one door open so you can see the interior, the side, then the side chain, the interior arrangement, is as close to a Meisterriss as you can come when you don't have one. Um, and then we have a series of drawings done in Berlin by a furniture maker from Braunschweig who had become, uh, who was a gazelle, he was a journeyman in Berlin in the, um, around 1820, and he made drawings there, which later on he took back with him to Braunschweig when he became a master cabinet maker there. That is why they survive. That is, they're almost the only Berlin furniture drawings of this Biedermeier period, of this early 19th century period, that survive. And I actually think that a lot of the drawings that we have are drawings made by craftsmen during their journeymen, during the period they were journeymen, when they were actually still in training. They're often very precisely dated, they're very precisely presented, and in fact you have a feeling often this person is not designing a piece of furniture, he is learning to draw a piece of furniture, which is what you learned when you were a gazelle, when you were a journeyman, when you were traveling from workshop to workshop. And apparently there was a tradition to keep the drawings of the period when you, were, when you had been learning. This person, Robert Marquardt, probably also produced designs when he, was, when he was established as a furniture maker in Braunschweig and showed them his clients, but those would be used when he was making his furniture, and most of them have been lost. Not all. So the next, um, the next chapter is drawings in a workshop, and we go to Rome, to the workshop of the Valadier, the most famous um, silversmith in Rome, who, um, by chance, um, they are the, the 18th century workshop from whose administration uh, the largest quantity of drawings survive, which have come onto the market in the 1990s, so we're, again, we're very late in the day. But we were interested, they were still with a dealer in London, he still had a bulk of them, all the smarter ones had been sold, but we were particularly interested in a drawing like this, which is really a silversmith designing a shape. Um, it, it's two-sided. At the back, you see a tureen, which is a bigger tureen, and in fact, I think this oval is the oval for the platter on which 
the Jerim on the back, is meant to stand. You see him working out shapes, and interestingly, he even cuts out the drawing to the shape of the platter on which the, um, the tureen is going to rest. So here, a drawing becomes a model. This is really a working drawing of a kind very, very rarely surviving. But we also have from Valadier this extraordinary design for one of his grandest commissions, huge silver and gilt bronze, um, chandeliers, which he made for the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in 1764. Before they were dispatched to Spain, they were shown in his workshop for three days, which created havoc in, uh, in, in Rome. Traffic ha came to a complete standstill. Nobody could move about because there were such enormous queues of people desirous to see these two wonders, these extraordinary chandeliers, before they went to uh, before they went to Spain. Last year, at the great Valadier exhibition at the Villa Borghese, they came back for the first time. They were visible in Rome. They are absolutely extraordinary. They're four meters high and of the most stunning quality. And um, really going through the catalog for that exhibition, I suddenly realized we have a design for them, the only known design for them. So this is a more finished design for a, an enormous work of art. As I said, drawings that are actually used as part of the making process are very, very rare. Naturally, they would be destroyed on the whole. So we're very pleased to have been able to acquire a set of over 100 drawings of mosaic showing musical instruments. And those um, are the exact, also exactly to size, the exact designs for the inlay in a series of chairs that uh, a furniture maker called Van Doren made for the large gallery in the Palace of the Prince of Orange in 1816, the Brussels Palace of the Prince of Orange. Um, and these chairs, a large number of them still survive, many now not any longer in the Royal Collection. But it had always been known that, obviously it was known, that every back represented a different uh, musical instrument. But it's fascinating that we have now um, acquired the drawings, the working drawings, the working designs for the inlay, most of which have an inscription saying which musical instrument they are. They're either a Chinese gong or an Assyrian uh, trumpet or an absolutely wide-ranging set of, of, of uh, 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 survey of historical musical instruments. Astonishing, because people who came to the gallery in the Palace of Brussels had no idea. There was nobody explaining to them, look, this is a history of musical instruments inlaid the back of chairs. Um, an extraordinary amount of attention going into the in We don't know quite, we don't sadly know who, well, Van Dora may himself have designed them, but who selected, uh, he, he must have used a large number of illustrative treatises from the 18th century on, on, um, on musical instruments. In fact, our curator of musical instruments has, has uh, he has found a number of 18th century books on Chinese musical instruments and so on that uh, this designer used. But here we have a chair. We, this was the only time we've reversed the process. We first bought uh, the drawings and then of course we felt that we had to buy some of the chairs. So we bought two chairs um, showing musical instruments for which we have the drawings. This, of course, is, raises the idea, are we just going to show drawings, or are they a little bit boring, and should you have objects next to them to make, to come alive, to make them come to life? That's what most people think. I'm very happy that Timo de Rijk and I agree that we may do it once or twice, very few times, but the exhibition is about drawings, and we want to make people look at the drawings. The moment you start illustrating them by having objects, people say, oh, yes, oh, look, it's just a certain light. Yes, how nice. Um, and um, the slightly more challenging um, uh, way of questioning what these drawings mean, and uh, so we want to inspire people to look at them um, more in the abstract. I'm going to be very quick. Drawn to sell. 
I think very, very many drawings represent works of art that are already in existence and that are being offered for sale. This is, these are two sides of a page um, of, a, of an album, of a small book of probably around 1600 glass vessels, possibly made in the Tyrol. Uh, we have a second page from the same book. Um, so you can imagine that a dealer or a representative of those glass works would come to a fair in Frankfurt or somewhere and carry with him a catalogue of the works of art he could supply. Augsburg, at the middle of the 18th century, was the center for Europe for the production of silver, especially if you wanted a big service quickly, and people always wanted things quickly. Um, you went to Augsburg because it was organized like a factory. There were very, very powerful, very rich silver dealers who could take a commission and divide the commission amongst many silversmiths, many workshops working in Augsburg. And within half a year, you could have an enormous service, as we know uh, from, from the one historic sur service surviving like that, which was really ordered and then commissioned and then delivered about four months later. Um, and Augsburg developed an extremely sophisticated system of drawings that were sent out to patrons um, to show the works on offer. Everything is to size. This is very often true of these drawings. They are very often of the size of the object to be made or that has already been made. And I find that rather a, a moving idea because if that drawing be sent somewhere, also for a large silver centerpiece, it's just exactly to the size, or for a clock, it's exactly to the size of the object, meaning it becomes the object. The architect can take the drawing and put it on the chimney piece and say, I think this is too big. This is not the right proportion. Uh, so they send it back and they say, we want a smaller one. Or if you're imagining a table, you know just exactly how large the centerpiece or the plates or everything going to be. The drawing becomes the work of art. Um, it's a bit of a cliche, of course, to say that we're now also used to images and that kind of thing, but of course it is true. To send something like this, and there's a lot of correspondence with Augsburg dealers, and even something that was sent over a hundred miles to some monastery in the Austrian mountains. Um, it, nobody could really come and look at Augsburg, and these drawings played an immensely important role in, um, in conveying a sense of the object. This is an extremely uh, delicate, refined drawing. If you see it, you hold the cutlery in your hand, and you can't see that on the reproduction that it is. So they trained draftsmen to an extraordinary degree, and the coloring, the detailing, it's quite amazingly tactile and fulfills its role very quickly. Um, there are many ornament prints. So, of course, we sometimes have a drawing that is an example for a print. This is an 18th century, again, Augsburg vase, which was published as a print. So it's, an op so it's a drawing of an object never meant to be realized. It's meant to be engraved and then distributed as a print. Then there are drawings that record or objects already in existence, inventory drawings. You could have um, uh, um, a, a rich person who had a lot of objects might want a pictorial inventory of the, the works of art in his possession, especially precious works of art, works of silver and gold. Now, very often, if you see a drawing, you don't quite know, is this an inventory drawing? It doesn't look free enough to be a design. What is this quite? So we're very fortunate in having a wonderful group of three of these drawings of hard stone cups mounted in gold. And then the, the, the containers, the foudrales, the cases in which they were stored in a treasury. Um, that makes it very clear that they are inventory drawings. And if the, the, the owner, the prince, would say, I, I want for my buffet tonight, I want the Calcaduni cup and I want the agate cup and this and that, um, his mayordomo would think, yeah, but how am I going to Daryl in cases? How do I know which one is which? So uh, there was also a drawing for the case, and he could just go for the case and then check whether he had the right object. 
then people start to draw works of art not to record them, but because they are old, because they are um, antiquities, antiques, and they are admired as such. Uh, this is a drawing probably made around some Esther van der Hoorn, who is here, has discovered that we bought a series of 26 drawings after Van Vianen and Silver, Silver by Adam van Vianen and his son Christian, probably. And Esther van der Hoorn, I said, well, when, when can these have been done? When was all this silver together? And Esther said, well, Anthony Gill had it all um, before it was sold in 1728. So, and she's written about it in the Burlington and also in another magazine, and it's uh, totally convincing to my mind. Um, so, Anthony Gill, who brought together the largest collection of silver by Van Vianen ever assembled, for some reason had drawings of all that silver made. Again, exactly to size, like photographs. They are photographic in their accuracy. Uh, we don't know why. Perhaps he wanted to um, have a volume of engravings made. Perhaps he saw the moment coming that they had to be sold and wanted to preserve a record. But it's a different type. It's to record something from the past. And then the last chapter is towards a new age when we do address this person, this industrial designer, somebody, so we're turning towards Art Nouveau here, somebody who is... Um, designing, certainly not executing himself, like Slauterman, um, uh, the, the, the designer who went to Paris in 1892 and then came back and um, set up the department at Delft. Here, a rather feeble, I have to say, rather feeble um, uh, version of French Art Nouveau, but um, we're, we're addressing the new age as well. Thank you very much for your attention. If you want more lectures, let me just point out that um, on the 21st of September, we will have the Daniel Marot lecture, the annual Daniel Marot lecture at the Rijksmuseum. We are rather late in announcing it because like, like Leiden here, um, we were unsure what we could do with the corona situation. But now we have decided to do it, to move on. But again, there will only be 75 people allowed in. So if you want a ticket, be quick, because we've only, it's only come out um, at the end of last week, and I think we're already half full. Um, those of you who have applied for today will get an email tomorrow from Alexander um, explaining how you can order your ticket for the Marot le lecture. It's going to be wonderful. I'm not going to talk about it. I've talked too much, but um, very worthwhile. Thank you so much for your attention, and um, now there might be some questions. Come and see the exhibition. It opens on the 22nd of November of next year. Thank you very much. Then you for this really interesting lecture. Really looking forward to seeing the exhibition. Uh, there are many questions of the, the people uh, online because there are more than 300 people online. It's a bit strange in this room with only 50 people, but uh, let me just give the floor to, 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 to one a few of those questions. I already apologize for the people who asked questions uh, online, which we cannot do because we don't have that much. Uh, time uh, left. But one of the questions is about theory. So you were addressing the theory of disegno, the theory of ingenio, uh, but that's really concentrated on the theory of painting. Is there uh, an early modern uh, theory of decorative arts? Is there someone uh, who has written a theory of the dec decorative arts as Famander did or uh, Vasari did? Not in that way, <clears throat> but of course, neither Van Mander nor Vasari concentrates on painting. They, they address this matter of Raphael or Michelangelo or many other great artists um, designing works of the decorative arts. They are, they are um, um, well, as I say, Raphael was famous for having done so, Giulio Romano was famous for having done so, and Vasari gives ample attention to this in his biographies of the artists. 
um, he calls it uh, biographies of the, of the most famous painters, but um, it just exactly shows that, that their activity was not constricted to what we now consider painting. Um, of course, Raphael also designed the loggia in the Vatican, so he revived the art of the grotesque. And Raphael's grotesque very soon became just as, as important as examples to, to decorators and architects as the antique ones found in the Domus Aria. Um, when when, um, when Vasari talks about Disegno being the master of all arts, he is already addressing sculpture, architecture, and um, and painting. He doesn't, it's true, he does, well, as I said, a decorative art is such a horrid notion. We don't, it's not a notion. Kunst neighborhood, of course, nobody wrote in the, in the 16th century about Kunst neighborhood because it's a non, it's a non noma. Um, it, and it, it's what makes the study of it so difficult because it's so difficult to define what you're dealing with is, is every, sorry, I'm going a bit on a bit too long, but is every as I say, pewter spoon, is that the same as, uh, as Cellini's gold sword? They're both works of the decorative arts, but it, it, of course they are completely different things. Vasari does, does of course also mention Cellini and, um, and, and is very eloquent on his, on his ingenio, which is, which is translated into disegno. So that part of theory is, yeah, you can't say it's a theory of the decorative arts, but it's a theory of artistic invention, which plays a great role for the decorative arts as well. And it's exactly that, that phenomenon that we're hoping to investigate through these drawings. Uh, another question from the people online, and then I give the floor to, to you, the, f the people who are real here on campus, is so many drawings did uh, disappear but those who, who were still there, what's the reason why they kept it? Was there, were there famous collectors, for example, already in the early modern period who really kept those drawings, who were collecting? Were there already people really interested in that kind of collection? Um, it's a very good question, and, um, it's, and it's a very complex question. On the whole, from the very early collectors onwards, Drawings collectors tend to have concentrated on drawings attributed to people. So already Mariette and before him Padre Resta, who was a, a very famous late 17th century um, collector of drawings in, the, in, in Rome. They already compiled uh, um, a kind of dictionaries and compiled a kind of handbooks trying to describe the hand of the various masters. So from the very start, uh, drawings collectors seem to have concentrated on, on great names, so to speak. But that Padre Resta also compiled a book which he called Libri de Grotteschi, and which, which consists of designs, because he put together books of, the, of, of designs, books of drawings, which are at the basis of some of the great English collections because they came to England later on. But he compiled one which he called Libri de Grotteschi, which is decorative designs, designs for goldsmith's work, for grotesques and other things, which he then sent to another padre in uh, Sicily where it survives, showing that he early on uh, formed a collection of that kind. Many of these, like the Valadier drawings I showed you, many of these drawings survived either in workshops or among craftsmen working in, uh, in, in similar fields. And the great 19th century collections are almost all formed by architects. Detailleur, Hippolyte Detailleur, was the greatest collector of this material in Paris. Who, who formed three great collections. The first one went to Berlin and is what now is, is now the extraordinary collection in the Kunstbibliothek. The second one went to uh, Russia, to St. Petersburg, and is at the Hermitage. And the third one was sold, and luckily we have a few for, for, of his drawings. But he was an architect, and um, many other um, 
uh, theater designers from the early 19th century, theater designers seem to be interested in drawings of this kind, probably because they are designing props for historicist plays. Um, so we have some drawings giving early, that have early marks pointing to a theater designer. Um, in Holland, Godefroy in Amsterdam, Godefroy was a, a famous, well, a well-known architect in Amsterdam who sadly didn't collect drawings, but collected an extraordinary, put together an extraordinary collection of architectural treatises from the past, which we now have at the Rijks Museum, which is a fantastic, which is our detailleur collection, but sadly not drawings. So I think it's often practitioners of architecture or the crafts who, um, yeah, who, who kept these drawings. But of course, you know, when they're by Holbein or when they're by uh, Inigo Jones, in fact, or then, then, they have, then they have entered grand collections early on. Are there questions from the auditorium? 